I'm Honza. I came from APRE, uh, and I came from Prague, from, from Czech Republic. And I'm here to tell you something about API design lifecycle. That's me. I like APIs, I like Python, and I like to tell anyone else they should like Python. And I'm sort of cartoonist. This is uh, what I want to talk about today. What's wrong on the classic API design? Second, how to do it better? And third, how can API help with this? So first, let's look at how people design and develop APIs today. Like, what's the most common way? Uh, at the beginning, there is uh, usually a guy who says something like, we need an API. That guy could be you, that could be your boss, or it could be your users wanting an API. But you need an API, right? So then there's a bunch of developers uh, gathering in a room uh, with a whiteboard or something, uh, and they make those design decisions and discussions and agreeing on things, how it should look like, what features should it have, should it be hypermedia or whatever. Then they buy quite a lot of coffee and, uh, you know, those Red Bulls and, and they go down to cellars uh, for a couple of weeks and months. Uh, and then they develop the thing. They come up with a ready API. They show it to the customer, like client developers. And those client developers don't like it very much. Like, then they look at it and say, OK, those are like names of tables in the database or what? And I wanted to just list those things. And uh, they don't really relate to, to this design. Nobody asked them. So this whole cartoon uh, could be reduced to something like this. Like API providers are doing something else than API customers or API consumers want. So what happens here, really? Like, we design API, we implement it, we show it to the customer, customer's unhappy, and gives us feedback. But this whole process uh, takes weeks and months. And to incorporate, incorporate the feedback, it takes another weeks and months. And we have already a name for this, 40 years. Like in 70s, it was an amazing age, particularly for Sweden. Uh, and waterfall model was coined. So for 40 years, we have a name for this. We know this is bad, uh, but we're still doing it. So what can we do about this? Uh, I think the first thing we need to realize is we need to understand the, what is an API. Um, people think that API is something like uh, we build something for machines, you know, there are these programs and scripts and uh, mobile applications and they will use the API. But that's not really the case. API is an interface, that's quite obvious from the eye. It's an interface to data. We all know this, but it's an interface to data for client developers. Uh, yeah, who are these client developers? Like, uh, who in this room develops client applications for APIs? Not so many. So, let me introduce you who are these client developers. This is typical client developer, client Tina. She's front-end developer, mobile app developer, and she thinks in terms like Objective-C, JavaScript, and this kind of stuff. She's obviously a human. She's not a machine. She uses your API. And you should design your API for a human. You should Take care about usability 
consistency and those things. You already know that from web design. Read Jacob Nielsen. She also has different concerns. I am one of those backend guys, or I was one of those backend guys. So I know that when I was designing an API, I was thinking in terms of frameworks, databases, database tables, ORMs, or versioning. Everybody's asking about versioning, how to do it properly. But Clientina doesn't really relate to those, to those things. She thinks in terms of JavaScript and examples and get the stuff done. How to do this? How to do this? I want to list those things. How can I quickly put that into my Angular application? And there's also the culture differences. Like, uh, you know, developers today, they cluster around languages, programming languages. And we all know that it's a bit different to develop uh, an API in, uh, or any application in Java or Python or JavaScript. Like, it's, it's not only the different naming conventions, uh, like underscores and camel case, but really that's about approaches. Uh, like, idiomatic Python is something really different than idiomatic Java. You need a lot of more files. Uh, and what I want to say is that you can't buy a book uh, like how to design APIs properly for client developers for dummies. It's like there is no such book and there can't be such book. You can't just read it out from articles like 10 things not to forget when designing APIs properly for client developers. Uh, you can't learn this empathy easily. You need to ask your front-end client developers because there is a big chance they are different from the others. You have uh, your domain, your use cases, and you need to target your client developers and understand them. And the best way to do this is to ask them. The crucial thing is communication and cooperation. And as you could also read in those books about waterfall model, the answer to waterfall model is prototypes and iterations. So you should documentation first, focus on use cases, and prototype and iterate. So how it looks now. You design the API, you create prototypes, you give them to client developers, they try it out, give you feedback and say, okay, this is bad, okay, this is quite nice, we need this, we need this. Then you get back to design, then you again prototype and you iterate on this until you agree on something which is usable for both sides. And then you implement the API, like for real. And the customer is happy because he was part of the process. But how to do this? I believe there are many ways to do this. But uh, in API we believe the best way to do this is API Blueprint. Which is basically a text file uh, it looks something like this. And it's also a markdown file. So if you ever contributed on GitHub or wrote a comment on Stack Overflow, you already know this. It's just a markdown with added semantics. It's perfectly human writable, human readable. You can give it to non-tech people and they can understand it, they can write it. Uh, it's just an art document. You can give it to your tech writer who writes your te uh, technical documentation and he can just work with it. You can version it, it's line oriented. You can share it, you can con collaborate on it. 
And you can also parse it. We have an open source parser who can take this document and parse it to a tree, like tree of JSON objects, doesn't matter. And uh, with this tree, you can do a lot of, do a lot of stuff. For example, we uh, generate a documentation from it. This is how it looks like. And what's the real magic in this? Like, back to the context of this presentation. The real magic is that you write down your contract into the blueprint. You share it on both sides. Immediately as you write it down, you can generate mocks from that prototypes. You can give it to your front-end developers and get immediate feedback. They can build real applications using your API, which doesn't even exist yet. And then, when you start to de develop the API, implement it, you got tests. We have open source testing tool, which takes the blueprint, takes your API application, and tests if it's really what you designed, like if it fits, like the responses and requests, everything. And you can put it into your continuous integration, so you have a contract. And this is what you really do. Like you design the thing, you start from designing, not from code. Then you prototype, you provide mocks to your client developers, you implement, you test it, the, the implementation with the blueprint, then you deliver with documentation, and then you get a feedback. And that's the life cycle. And this is like almost my last slide. The ecosystem around the API blueprint is already large. Like, uh, and it's mostly open source. API IO is just one pretty good tooling for the API blueprint. But if you don't want to, it's not vendor lock-in. You don't have to use it. The Dread is the testing application, the, the command line tool. There's integration with KHub. You can get mock server, debugging proxy server, documentation rendered. We have plugins for editors, SOAP UI. Hi, guys. <laughs> JSON schema works quite well with it. So this is the only image I haven't drawn myself. So thanks, Leo. Uh, what I want to say, if you never ever will use API Blueprint or API or whatever, please remember don't forget about your client developers because they are the customers of your API. You are doing the, your API for them, not for your database tables. And yeah, that's pretty much what I want to say, I think. If I have any more like time, no? You, you do, but after, uh, after the next talk. We're not not for questions, just to show something. You got one minute. OK. One minute's enough. Uh, this is how it looks. I don't know if you see it. On an editor, but you can edit it in Sublime Text. This is how the documentation looks like. There are full featured like examples. You can call it, but I oh, I don't see it on my like, I, I, I. Uh, slow internet, okay. And I want to just say that uh, on this side you can get all the tooling and all the stuff tried out, and there are specs, and we are ready for hypermedia and all that and so on. I put my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Hansa. Great, great presentation. <laughs>